All right. So thank you, everyone who's watching this recording. Uh, this is the Roadshow for Research, Common Misconceptions and How to Get Involved. We're going to have a couple guest speakers talk about this. Um, and if you have any questions, our contact information will be at the end. So starting out, just your hosts for today are me and Amy. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce ourselves since we're going to be kind of guiding us through the rest of this, um, this presentation. So my name's Eden. I am a second year undergraduate student studying psychology. Uh, Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name's Amy. I'm also a second year undergrad. I'm studying anthropology and biology. So now we're going to get right into the presenters. So up first, we have Addison Wool. He is the Honors Assessment Manager and Admissions Coordinator, and he was kind enough to join us on this Friday afternoon. So take it away, Addison. Oh, if you could unmute yourself, Addison. <laughs> wow, it is Friday. So hello, thanks uh, for having me. Like Amy said, I'm the Assessment Manager and Admissions Coordinator uh, for the Honors Program. I'm happy to be here. Um, in past lives, I've been a laboratory manager and a research student in the College of Medicine. So um, I'm happy always to talk about research. Um, and preemptively, I'm a resource. So um, my email was on the previous slide. So definitely if you ever have any questions, questions about research in general, finding a mentor, what does ever anything mean, mean, send me a message. I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Um, I'm also happy I prepared some slides um, as well to talk about research. Um, currently in Japan is the Cherry Blossom Festival that I've never been to, but I dream of going. So Microsoft had this as a background, so enjoy that. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is research, how to get honors credit for research, um, and the resources that are available for y'all. So what is research? Well, according to uh, the Health and Human Services Department, uh, research is defined as a systemic investigation, which includes research development, testing, and evaluation, which is designed uh, to develop or contribute uh, to generalizable knowledge. So that means uh, that taking a survey of your class of the, favorite, uh, the best place to get pizza in Iowa City is not research. That is not generalizable knowledge that's gonna be applied to all colleges across the uh, United States, for example, right? So that's a, that's a survey. Um, University Honors adds another layer onto that because um, we consider undergraduate research to be uh, the definition above, but also mentored. So you have to have a, a UI mentor mentoring you while you engage in this seeking of generalizable knowledge. So that's a really broad um, definition. And that's on purpose um, because research looks like many different things. When I say research, uh, I'm sure a lot of y'all are just thinking about uh, laboratory scientists in a white coat with pipettes, um, especially now uh, in the COVID pandemic, moving very small amounts of liquid from one tube to another. And that is a form of research. Um, but I'm gonna give a quick couple examples um, so from the College of Education, uh, research can be uh, the studying the ways transgender students get to pay for and explore their identities in college. Um, from the College of Medicine, uh, epigenetic regulation of genes related to resting metabolic rate and diabetes. Uh, from the dance department in class, developing a new movement technique to be used in fusion of samba and modern dance forms. That's research. Creating a better Bayesian nested clustering with finite mixture models that's coming from the biostatistics department and health of public health. The effects of healthcare access, cognitive de development and mental health on immigrant workers in Iowa, also from the College of Public Health. Um, how placement of ad materials on a page influences the likelihood of purchase of a product or positive ratings of that product coming from Tippy. College of Business. So all these are research, and these are all things students can and have been involved in um, on campus. 
And I think the next speaker is going to speak more about that. Um, oh, this slide should have been a little later, but um, so how to get credit for honors research. Um, for research, how to get honors credit for research. So the first option is to take a research course. So on the uh, honors webpage, experiential learning, um, there are a no quite a number of courses listed um, where if you enroll in that course, you're going to automatically get experiential learning credit for those courses. Um, so these are courses that have a non-zero semester hour credit. So that's one, two, three, usually. Um, and however many semester hours of credit you enroll in are the number of credits you're going to get on your experiential learning uh, honors degree audit. Um, this is, can be found on the experiential learning webpage under the research tab option one. Um, also included this is if you're an iCrew fellow, that's a zero semester hour course, but it counts as automatically as experiential learning credit. Another option is if you're doing paid volunteer uh, research on a paid or volunteer basis, like when I was in college, I volunteered in a, with a research group for four years. I didn't get paid for that. Or you're enrolled in a zero semester hour course. That's not uh, iCrew fellow based. So for this, you're going to complete the honors reflection process, which involves a pre-experience questionnaire and then a post-experience questionnaire narrative once you've completed uh, your, your experience. So that doesn't mean every semester, that means um, you know, uh, when the experience is over or maybe a couple months before you graduate so we can get that added to your degree audit. Um, and if you have questions about how many credits you're maybe earning, uh, a great thing to do is to check in with me um, or check in with uh, experiential learning director, uh, Andrew Willard. And you can learn more about that on the website also. This is considered option two. Um, paid, volunteer, or credit. Um, for the honors program, it makes no difference. So sign up for any sort of uh, experience that's going to be best for you. Um, you know, if you're able to find a research group that's going to pay you for the work, um, most often that's going to be, say, the College of Medicine Research Lab or the hospital or in engineering typically have paid research positions. Um, great. If you are volunteering for a research group, also you, awesome, you also get credit, um, honors credit. And, or if you're taking it as a course and it's going to count towards your major, great, do that. You'll also get honors credit. There's no bias at all uh, within the honors program when it comes to honors credit. Um, here are just a few resources I've listed. Um, I could also show the website if anyone has any questions how to navigate the website. Uh, but this is my email, um, iCrew, which is the Iowa Center for Research by Undergraduates uh, at the University of Iowa, has a lot of different resources about getting involved in research, how to find mentors, and scholarship and fellowship opportunities that you can apply for. Um, Melinda Licht, um, her email here, is a great person to contact uh, for some of that information. Uh, there's, there are other research fellowship programs, like the Lantham Fellows, um, which I have linked here, um, and again, our, our, our honors website, uh, where you can learn a lot more information about that. Um, yeah, so that, there's, there's the quick and dirty version of uh, research with honors, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that y'all have. All right, thank you so much, Addison. Um, I'm just gonna go right ahead and move us into our next guest speaker. So Caroline Meek is going to speak next. She's, gonna, she's an honors peer mentor, and she's majoring in English and creative writing on the publishing track. She's going to talk to us a little bit about iCrew and creative projects. So um, take it away, Caroline. Cool. Thanks, Eden. Um, I kind of feel like Addison introduced everything that I'm going to talk about more in detail. So this is perfect. Um, I won't have to explain almost anything. Um, yeah, so I'll start with iCrew. I was an iCrew fellow three years in a row during the summer term. And so I did two research fellowships with the International Writing Program. And then I did one with Rescue Press, a publishing company run by um, the director of the Magid Center here. Um, so he was like faculty at the University of Iowa, but he also 
directed this publishing company. And so that's how that kind of worked. Um, typically, the iCareer fellowships are under a faculty mentor that works at the University of Iowa or some organization or department on campus. Um, so my origin story with iCareer and everything is that I walked into Melinda Lick's office and um, actually Dr. Spizak walked me down the hall into her office and said, Melinda, tell Caroline about the research because she has a cool project that might fit into iCRE really well. And Melinda gave me like three names to go look up of potential mentors. And I ended up um, working with Kate DeSherry at the International Writing Program. And I was involved there for three years after that. So it was really, um, Melinda has really good advice and kind of like helping you find a path to go down um, if you're not sure where to start. So she helped me find my mentor which was amazing. We still are in contact. Um, but after that, I just kind of went through the process of applying for the research fellowship, which I will just share my screen here briefly because um, the academic year fellowship application is still open. Um, and so that would be for next academic year. And these, these research positions are paid. And so they're about uh, $2,000 for the summer, I think. And that's about 15 to 20 hours a week. And then the academic year is 25. No, I switched that up. I think it's 2,500 for the summer, 2,000 for the whole academic year. And that's reduced hours more like 10 hours a week. Um, so that's just an idea that I wouldn't have been able to do research if it had been volunteer or unpaid since I was, I, I needed a job over the summer. So this was a really good option for me. Um, one of the biggest obstacles I had in trying to understand um, iCrew and research was what is research. Um, and so I see the website has this really great little series of pictures of all these things that are research. Because um, I definitely was under the impression that it was something like Addison was describing, like in a lab. Um, and while I did a lot of that in high school, I wasn't interested in it at the moment for myself. Um, I am an English and creative writing major and I focus on writing poetry. So my first semester working with iCrew was kind of like, how, how do I do research? What does creative work look like in the context of research? Um, and for me, it was researching great, uh, creative global communities um, with the International Writing Program summer camp as a specific case study. So this is the poster that I created for my um, kind of like end of the project presentation. And it's gonna take a while to load because it's a big, it's a big guy. Um, yeah, so this was my first year in iCrew and I presented at the research festival. And this kind of just is an example of what I did. I was taking pictures for their summer camp. They had high schoolers come in from all around the world. And I kind of used that experience to First of all, reflect on it personally, um, which is a sort of research also. I was observing the dynamics between the students and the way that the administrator set up the program. And then I also sent out a survey talking about um, writing community and then reflected on how that could be applied to general writing communities and how um, other programs could do similar things. Um, so this is kind of an overview of what I did there. Um, if you're trying to think about how does the scientific method, for example, apply to creative work, um, I've got my introduction, I've got a couple of headings that are describing the two different things that I was working with, and I described some of my research um, on the literature that already existed on like social networking and global communities online and in person, um, and then I included this example of the survey that I sent out with a couple key um, answers that I wanted to highlight um, that kind of helped me reach my conclusion. And then I reflected and kind of summed it all up in a paragraph or two about my process and conclusion. Um, so it's pretty, the standard template can be applied to a lot of things. Um, instead of graphs, I've got pictures. And instead of, um, I don't know, I have like a poem fragment in there from my reflection. So it really can go um, in so many different directions. I've heard proposals for projects that range from like, 
I'm going to go travel to this town and observe the town and write about it in my novel. And I need to research the, the setting of my novel or something. Um, so doing research for a project or um, something like that, there are all many options um, for that. There's also uh, multiple ways to find a mentor, if that's something that you're trying to do. Um, Melinda just gave me a really great lead. So you could go do that um, or ask Bob Kirby. Um, I think he's still working in that specific office, but um, a lot of professors are already working on research. So you can just go ask them like, hey, what are you doing? Or maybe they talk about it in class um, and they talk about like how they work with snails all the time. And I know someone who worked with snails in the past, like she's graduated now, but she had a cool snail project. and. Yeah, maybe your professor talks about their work and you're like, I wonder if that's counts as research and maybe I could help them with it. Um, so you could just like barnacle onto them and that's that's really great. Or um, you could just go up to them and propose a project. So I, I kind of did that with an independent study this year. I just went up to my poetry professor and I said, hey, I have this idea. Will you mentor me? Um, and just outright directly asked her. And that's something she wanted to do because that's she's interested in it also. and that's she's working here and is interested in talking with students. So don't be afraid of asking for, I guess asking for someone's time in a reasonable and interesting way with something that they're already doing. Um, and then I think the honors website also has um, like a forum or a resource for finding posted research positions that you could also look for if it's um, something. I haven't used that because a lot of the departments I'm trying to find don't post their positions because it's not like lab positions or anything, but there are, there are a lot of ways to find those. Um, yeah, was there, even was there anything else that you wanted me to talk about? No, that was really great. I got, I'm glad we got to hear about um, iCrew and your creative project. Um, that was really cool to hear about, but th that was, that's great. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Yay. Caroline. Thanks. Okay, so I'm up next. And yes, thank you, Caroline, so much. I feel like a lot of what we hear is STEM focused. So it was really great for you to show the other side that doesn't get as much attention. So um, awesome. So like I said before, my name's Amy. I'm a second year undergrad and I'm going to transition into more of the STEM uh, research. I currently work with Professor Kitchen who's in the anthropology program uh, working on virus evolution. So to go to the next slide, uh, this is a project that I started this semester because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, what I wanted to major in, and so I wasn't sure where to start with research, but um, I decided to add an anthropology major, and I took a class with Professor Kitchen, and I lucked out that on the first day of class, he had a slide that said, these are all the projects I'm involved in. If you want to get experience in the lab, email me. So I emailed him the first week and he emailed me back. We met. Um, he was he was really nice. It was very easy. He um, explained to me the project. I said that I was interested and and that was it. And um, this is an example of something that I've I've done working with him. It's a phylogenetic tree because we are studying um, virus evolution. So a phylogenetic tree is basically a visual way to kind of represent um, evolution and the way that different species can be related. So the software that I work with is called Beast, and it's a way to uh, take the genetic data and process it down and put it into a form that can be then read and turned into a tree like this. So this uh, is for yellow fever, the specific virus, and um, it compares samples that were taken in the Americas against samples that were taken in Africa from different times to try to figure out when um, the virus jumped from Africa to the Americas because there was a theory that it, it most likely crossed um, on slave ships, but we needed some kind of uh, molecular data to back this up. And I just want to preface by saying that this was part of a tutorial through the B software. So I did make this tree by using the software, but this isn't my data. I didn't solve the mystery of how yellow fever got to the Americas. This was me recreating someone else's in the process of learning how to do it with my own uh, virus that I will eventually get. But it's hard to see because the, the print is so small, but um, it works chronologically. So left to right, oldest to newest. So this fits with the idea that um, the samples that are further to the left are the African 
samples and the samples further on the right are the American samples. So it fits with the uh, theory that it originated in Africa. And then the most recent common ancestor of the American samples happened later on. So, and it, because it is related to the African samples that were taken, it was brought over to America at a later time. So that's just a quick overview of some of the stuff that I'm working on. Uh, but how I got involved, just to touch back on that, like I said, I reached out to uh, Professor Kitchen, who, who offered it out to me. So I jumped on that opportunity. Um, and Eden's going to talk about her research next. And it's very different from what I'm doing, which is very different from what Caroline did. Everybody's experience is pretty unique. Uh, but mine is more of uh, an independent kind of project. It's not really, I'm not in a lab working with a bunch of people. It's very, I, I work pretty closely with uh, Professor Kitchen and he helps me and gives me uh, things to do and helps me figure out how to get everything done. And how my research started was by reading a book. He gave me a 300 page book on molecular evolution and I had to read the whole thing. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't always the most riveting or it was, it was kind of hard to get through and I found myself not understanding a lot of it even as I was going through, uh, which was something that I had to become comfortable with the fact that you know I didn't know anything going into this about genetics or phylogenetic trees or viruses so I was ready to learn but I also had to understand that I wasn't just going to get it right away so the book provided me a good basis and I still have it and I can use it for reference but after I finished all 300 pages I was able to start with the software and I went through all these different tutorials and it was a slow much slower process than I was anticipating but this is the outcome of one of the tutorials that I did. And it's, I'm slowly building confidence. I'm still not, I'm definitely not an expert so far from being an expert in this, but I, I'm gaining a little more knowledge every time I do something and um, I'm messing up and I'm figuring things out. And to quote something that Professor Kitchen told me when I was emailing him saying that I was confused. He was saying that as part of the research process and he said, if you get stuck, take a breath, try it again, and then email me if you have a problem. So, um, and he's, he's the only uh, mentor I've worked with, but from what I've heard, they're, they're all very, very patient, very understanding and very willing to help you. So that is a, a quick overview of, of my story, but the things that I really wanna to touch on were that um, seize every opportunity that comes your way because if a professor says that they have a lab and they're interested in having people join, they're not just saying that for fun, they're serious about wanting people to join. And, and I lucked out that he did offer it. So if someone says something that sounds interesting, email them, email them. The, the other thing that I learned from this is that the worst anybody could do is say no. And if they say no, you find something else because there's, there's a million different things for you to do. So don't be afraid um, to, to seize every opportunity that comes your way. And the other thing is that, like I said, I had absolutely no experience. I picked up the anthropology major the same week that I joined the research lab. I had no background information. Um, and there were a lot of times where I was meeting with him and where I was going through the stuff where I felt, I'm never gonna get this, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's not about what you bring, it's about what you're willing to do once you're there. So uh, don't, don't freak out about not feeling like you're not smart enough or you're not, don't, don't worry about that. As long as you show enough initiative and you show enough drive to want to do well, they will, they will do the rest for you. They'll meet you wherever you are. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that I joined. Um, it's, I use it as an opportunity to try to figure out what I wanted to do because I, there's so many options and the only way that you're really going to figure out what works and what doesn't work for you is by getting out there and trying it. So I'd highly encourage you to reach out, send out an email, um, use one of the many great resources that Addison talked about, that Caroline talked about, email any of us. But yeah, it's, there's something really fun about finding something that you're passionate about and doing something outside of, of your schoolwork. So um, yeah, that was my little story. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything. Uh, and now I'm gonna pass it off to Eden. All right, thank you. Thank you, Amy, so much for talking about your individual project. Um, that sounds really cool to be working with. So uh, just like Amy did um, and Caroline, I'm gonna kind of talk about the research that I'm involved with and how I got involved with it. Um, 
mine might be more of the stereotypical kind of research because I work in a lab with a bunch of other people who also work in this lab. Um, but, you know, like Amy said, all research experiences will be kind of different in terms of um, who you're working with, how many people you're working with, and what you're studying. Um, so just to recap, I'm a second year undergraduate student. I'm studying psychology and education studies and human relations with a minor in music and a certificate in resilience and trauma and foreign perspectives. Um, so the lab that I'm part of is called the Development Experience in Neurocognition Lab. Our broad research question is why some students um, from dif disadvantaged backgrounds often fall behind their peers in academics. So we do things like uh, academic tests and coding parent-child interactions, uh, the behavior that they use to see um, why certain students fall behind. So one of the things that I've been doing in part of this lab is that I do this, I do transcriptions, which basically involves taking an audio file of parent and child interacting. They're normally doing a puzzle or some game and I code for the language utterances, which is basically like a smaller unit of speech that they use. Um, and I got to follow this like six page long protocol sheet, making sure that um, I'm coding it correctly because we know that the more utterances that they use, the stronger their out academic outcomes will be. Um, I'm working with a couple of other people on this and we have to work to get 95% uh, innovator reliability with our, with our transcriptions. So that's, that's been a pretty tedious but fun process. Um, it's a big part of research is working with others as well. And I'm glad to be working on that. And another thing that I've been doing is I'm currently being trained to work with the children. So one of the things that we're doing is, you know, there's, we run a bunch of different tests and games with the kids. Um, one of the games is called statue and the kid has to stand like a statue with their eyes closed for 75 seconds. And it's just really fun to see because they think it's four to six year olds will think it's like the hardest thing in the world to do for 75 seconds. It feels like an eternity. So it's a really fun, fun game that we play and we're, in that test, we're testing their attention span, um, but we do a bunch of little games like that. And I'm currently being trained to start running those sessions. So a little bit about how I got involved. Last semester, I was in research methods and data analysis one, which is a class that every psychology student has to take. Um, it was asynchronous, but my professor in her lecture videos, she kept bringing up her lab because it's relevant to research methods. Um, but every time she talked about it, I kind of got more interested. So I actually just Googled her on, and I found her lab website, which um, isn't very hard to find you, if you just Google your professor, if you know they have a lab. Uh, I read a little bit more about the research that she conducts, saw that it was a good fit for me because it sounded interesting. Um, and then I emailed her to set up a Zoom meeting just as a way that she could get to know me. Um, she was super nice and um, it was a pretty informal meeting. She was just kind of explaining what they do in the lab um, and how I can get involved, what I might be doing. She told me to submit an application. So I submit that and within a week, they told me they would love to have me in their lab. Um, so that's how I got started. I'm actually gonna take us to my lab page. A lot of labs will have um, a certain page that they'll use for, um, for their lab and it, here, okay. so. This, this is the lab page for the Development Experience in Neurocognition Lab. Um, there's normally a page called Projects um, that'll talk a little bit about what the research is, the projects that they run within the research. This is really important to go through just to make sure it's actually something you like. Uh, there's so many different ways you can get involved with research that I think it's really important that you do something that you're actually interested in. And then there's also this normally another tab that says like how to get involved or join the pack, something like this. So that's the page I was able to go to and scroll down to undergraduate research assistance where I found the application. So that was how I had to uh, um, submit my application. Within the application, it was pretty simple. It was kind of just a little questions like, why do you wanna get involved with this lab? What prior experience do you have working with children or working in a lab? I just want a side note that they're not expecting you to have any knowledge or any background experience with this. They're kind of asking that just to make sure or just to see where you're coming from. But they realize that most people getting involved with research maybe 
freshmen, sophomores, juniors who likely don't have any experience. Um, but yeah, again, they're just a little curious about where you're coming from. Um, and in general, like Amy said, you don't need to know how to do anything. There's so much that I have learned within this past couple of, within the past couple of months that I've been working with the DEN lab, um, like running the transcriptions or just the different methods you use for research, like how I have to get the inter-rater reliability with them, um, with the other research assistants. I've been learning so much and with my training as well, I've been being trained for a month to run the sessions. I probably won't be fully trained until summer which is, you know, a long process, but they're making sure that you're fully equipped to do things before they send you into a room and tell you like, oh, you're, you got to run some tests on some four year olds. There you go. Um, so yeah, they always make sure that you're fully equipped to do things, which is, um, yeah, it's kind of my favorite part about research. They, you learn so much from it. There's so many different ways to acquire knowledge within what the research is and also just among the people you're working with. Like I know Amy, is working with um, Dr. Kitchen, right? Yeah, and I'm sure she's getting so much knowledge from him. And I, my lab is composed of like 30 other research assistants. We range in ages from like, you know, graduate students to freshmen, undergrad freshmen. Um, so we, we meet every other week and it's a really good way for us to spread our knowledge. And we, we discuss empirical articles, um, it's really, it's really helpful and the older students definitely want to help the younger ones thrive and learn so much throughout the research so to get the most out of it so that's kind of been my experience it's been great um would recommend so just uh like i said my experience with getting involved my professor just kind of mentioned it in her lectures and i reached out to her i know there's other ways like there's pages for openings in labs but if you hear about your professor having some sort of research going on, definitely reach out to them if it's something you're interested in. So, yes, Emerson? Yeah, I just I want to reiterate that I know um, Amy talked about it, you've just talked about it, Eden, Caroline, um, but the University of Iowa is the highest research institution that formerly known as an R01, right? So every faculty person here is doing research. Um, and I have been in college or involved with a college in some capacity since 2010, right? And in that decade, I have not met what a single faculty person who did not want to talk about their research. Um, so if, if you're just, you know, maybe uh, if you have a class and you think the topic's interesting, stay after class or shoot the professor an email saying, I'm really interested in your research. You can cold call someone, right? Um, send someone in the, your department an email saying, I was looking at your page and you're doing research on X, Y, Z. That's really neat. I like, do you have any spots open? Uh, you know, or, or are you looking for research? Um, you know, do you have a research team I could join? Um, because the worst they could say is no, um, but more likely they're going to uh, talk to you about their research or help point you in the direction of someone who is looking for, um, you know, assembling a research team. Um, you know, that's how I got involved in research. I, uh, my intro to biology class, my freshman first semester of college, the professor mentioned something about social insects and I love bees. So I stayed after class and I was like, bees are neat, they're social insects. And then two weeks later, I'm helping him set out traps to collect uh, solitary nesting bees, um, which wasn't super interesting to me. Um, but then I was able to coordinate with uh, my organic chemistry professor and start doing a, a whole different experiment looking at fatty acid analysis through the lifespan of these species of bee. Um, and, you know, so many folks, my, the college I went to was much smaller, but that's how it happened. Like you just email uh, and say, hey, I don't know, or even emailing here email if you're more comfortable talking to the staff person, like the, you know, department uh, uh, coordinator, email the department coordinator and say, I'm interested in doing research. Do you know of any faculty, you know, looking and they'll point you in the right direction. Uh, you really can't go wrong. Um, and it's also okay if you're joining a research team and you're like, this is not for me. It doesn't mean you're not smart. It doesn't mean that you're not trying to work hard. It could just be, you'd be like, wow, I really don't like setting trap for bees. Like I don't find doing observational biology interesting or, right? So, so you can switch projects. And there's, that's one of the great things about experiential learning 
uh, and research as an undergrad because uh, you start to kind of investigate, you know, different aspects like of anthropology that you didn't under you didn't know before. And maybe you learn you love it, or maybe you're like, eh, this this aspect isn't for me. Maybe I should look elsewhere in a different sub specialty within the field. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think that's really great advice. And just the yeah, it's it seems terrifying until you do it, and then it's fine. Like I remember. Aiden, you were probably the same way. You were nervous about what are they going to say? Will I be able to find something? And then as soon as you get in and you get going, it's so much better and it's so much easier and it's a lot of fun, which is what it should be. It should be a fun experience. Yeah, I know. I know my first lab meeting, um, we were discussing a paper and I had so many thoughts on my mind, but I was like too scared to say them out loud. And then someone else would go and say exactly what I was thinking. And I was like, ah, oh, I should have said it. Um, it's a pretty welcoming environment, I think everyone's trying to just be nice and help each other out. So it, there's nothing really to be scared of at all. And also something else Addison said that I wanted to point out, they, professors love talking about their lab. Sometimes they won't stop talking about it. Um, when I first met my, um, the professor for my lab, Dr. Demir Lira, she, uh, she talked about it for like almost an hour. And I was like, oh, you know, that's, that's great. I'm glad to hear about this because it was actually something I'm interested in, but you know, they'll just kind of go off because they love it. And, you know, they want people to be part of it too. So uh, I think before we end this recording, I'm just gonna share some of our contact information in case you have any other questions. Um, this will be, you know, the last image on the screen, so. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for watching.